Hey, how y'all doing out there? Back again with another video. Um, I want to, com to complete my series on who is this man named Jesus Christ. But I want to come from this perspective of Jesus the Savior. Volume 1, I talked about Jesus being the Son of God. Proved that through the scriptures that I read to you. Also, Volume 2 was seeing Jesus as the Son of Man wanted you to know that he was not only God, but he was also a human being too. So he was fully God and he was fully man. And this one, my last one, volume three, Jesus as the savior, because he is the savior. Now you may ask, why is he the savior? He's the savior because he gave up his life for you and me. You know, he was the only one qualified to die for the sins of humanity. And let's jump right into it because I don't want to hold you long. The book of 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 3 through 5 reads as thus. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, speaking of Jesus, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. This is what God wants for all mankind. He wants all of us to be saved. Being saved means to rescue from danger or destruction, to deliver from the penalties of Jesus Christ because he's coming back. And when he's come, when he comes back, he's going to come back to judge the quick and the dead. All of us have to give an account unto God, whether the things we did good or whether the things we did bad. It doesn't matter. We all have to give an account, believers and non-believers alike. So he's our savior because... Now, when you get to Jesus being the Savior, it means the word Savior means deliverer and preserver. Now, you may say to yourself, well, what did Jesus deliver me from? For those that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and has repented of their sins and are living a holy life, he has saved them from the penalty and the power of sin. Because the Bible says that the wages of sin, meaning the, 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 the payment for sin, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So sin only brings death in the end. But the gift of God brings eternal life. So you have sin bringing eternal death. And you have Jesus who brings eternal life. And I don't know about you, but I don't think any of us wants eternal death. Eternal death is something that never ends. You want to die, but you can't die. You suffer and you burn in hell forever and ever in the, into the lake of fire. Eternal life with Jesus is a life where there's no more crying, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. That's what I want. I want eternal life. So it is Jesus' goal for that every man to be saved. He wants all of us to be rescued from the danger and destruction and the penalty of sin. And he wants us all to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who's the truth? The truth is Jesus. Jesus said himself, he says, I am the way. I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. No man comes to the father except by me. So if you want to know truth, get to know Jesus Christ and you will know truth. The remainder of that verse reads, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. A mediator is one who intervenes between two, either in order to make or restore peace and friendship. So like I just said to you, Jesus said he's the way. He's the truth. He's the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. So in order to get through the Father, you have to come through Jesus. And Jesus is the middle man. See, if we come to Jesus, then we can get to God the Father. But they still are one. That's why you have to go through Jesus first. Because his atoning blood, the blood he shed on Calvary's cross, will allow us to be able to have fellowship with the Father. And if we have in fellowship with the Father, we also have fellowship with the Son as well. Because they are connected. They are one and the same. He is the go-between. He is the middleman. And we want him in our lives. No doubt about it. In the book of Titus chapter 2 verse 11 through 14 it reads. 
For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. Now you may say, what do you mean? Because Jesus Christ died on a sin for all of us. And we all have a chance to experience his grace and his salvation. So you may say, well, brother, what is grace? Grace is nothing more than the merciful kindness by which God, exerting his holy influence upon souls, turns them to Christ, keeps, strengthens, increases them in Christian faith, knowledge, affection, and kindles them to the exercise of the Christian virtues. It is also defined as goodwill, loving kindness, and favor. This is what God's grace is. His grace is full of mercy and kindness and favor and goodwill. He, he wants the best for you. He wants the best for me. But you can only receive his grace if you accept him as your Lord and Savior. If you are willing to surrender your life to him. That means whatever you've been doing before doesn't matter anymore. Sin is only good. Sin is going to have its season, but at the end, sin brings forth death. Why take a chance on your life? Why play Russian roulette with your life? You only have one life and we don't know where death lies. So we got to give our life to Jesus Christ, whom we can trust because he gave up his own life just to get us into heaven, just to restore us to where we were supposed to be in the first place. So think about it, y'all. Think about it. Salvation. You may say, brother, what is salvation? Salvation is deliverance. It's safety from danger or destruction. What destruction? You may say destruction of eternal death. Destruction of sin itself. Sin is destructive because it's the opposite of God. Salvation is saved, saves you from the penalty and the power of sin. The presence and the most importantly, the pleasures of sin. Sin feels good when you're doing it. I know I've been a sinner. It feels good. It feels like it's worth it. Like this is all great. But at the end of the day, it means absolutely nothing and will get you nowhere. And at some point, your conscience is constantly bothering you saying, man, I know what I did felt good, but I know it was wrong. There were times, there were years when I was in, been in church all my life. And do you think I've been living holy and, and righteous all my life? No, I have not. I have fallen many times. And there were times when I was just flat out living in sin and trying to convince myself that I was saved when I clearly was not saved because I was living in sin. And you can't live in sin and, and say you're saved. There's no such thing. Because God will not live in an unclean temple. And our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Continue on Titus. It says teaching us. Listen to this. That denying ungodliness. We should always be looking to deny ungodliness. And worldly lust. The only thing that's out here in the world for the most part. Is do whatever makes you feel good. Do without will. Don't matter if anybody get hurt. Don't matter if you hurt yourself. Just do what feels good. No, we are supposed to deny ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly. It means alert. Righteously, meaning holy. And godly, meaning the same thing. Holy, doing what God requires. In this present world. We live in this present world while we're here. God expects us to live soberly, righteous, and godly. That's what he expects from us. Especially those that are believers. Especially those that say they know God. They say they have accepted him as their Lord and Savior. If you're not living righteously, soberly, and godly, you are not saved. I don't care what you say. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is coming back. There's no doubt about it. And it says here also, who gave himself for us. He gave his own life for us. That he might redeem us means to buy us back. We were, we were dead to sin. But because he gave up his life, he was able to redeem us. Once we accept him 
and accept his atoning blood and what he did on Calvary's cross and the fact that he was murdered and he was killed and that he was in the grave for three days and he rose again from the dead and went back to the Father. He redeemed us from all iniquity. Iniquity is wickedness. And it says here, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. This is what Jesus Christ, our Savior, has done for you and me. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, he did this for us. But I'm urging you, be a believer. Ask Jesus Christ to forgive you of all your sins. Be willing and really mean it that you want to turn from sin, that you're tired of living a lie. You're tired of doing the wrong thing. You're tired of feeling bad. You're tired of feeling guilty. You're tired of wanting to commit suicide. You're tired of living in fornication and adultery and witchcraft and homosexuality. You're just tired of living a life that you know is only going to get you eternal death. Now is the time to turn to Jesus Christ who can save you from your sin. It doesn't matter what you've done. He will save you. His blood is powerful enough to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Please accept him into your heart today. Your soul will live forever, but will it live forever in hell and the lake of fire? Or will it live forever with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm, in the new Jerusalem? Now is the day of salvation, not tomorrow. But this moment in time, right now, this is the time you need to make this decision. And it's the most important decision you can make in your entire life. Repent of your sins. Ask Jesus to come into your heart and cleanse you from all sin and fill you with his Holy Spirit. Start reading his word. Talk to him. And then find yourself a church that teaches the word of God as the final authority. It's worth it. The best decision you can ever make. God bless you. And I love you. And you're in my prayers. Until next time. God bless.